let's go. But you may say, we asked you to speak about women and fiction. What has that got to do with a room of one's own? I will try to explain. When you asked me to speak about women and fiction, I sat down on the banks of a river and began to wonder what the words meant. They might mean simply a few remarks about Fanny Burney. Who was Fanny Burney? I don't know. Does anybody know about Fanny Burney? I'm guessing she was a writer. She was. Um, in uh, the uh, 18th century, okay. she was a writer. Uh, she was the daughter of a musicologist. Ooh. And she was brought up to, the, to use her, her mind. She became a satirical novelist and a playwright. She's written a number of, of quite marvelous uh, satirical comedies, one of them being The Whittlings, which I have used in a number of uh, period studies of the 18th century. Very good. Um, and she's quite, quite marvelous, as a matter of fact. So, and? Um, a few more about Jane Austen. I trust you know something about Jane Austen. Yes. So, uh, 1775 to 17, to, 17 um, to 18, I think about 10 or 12. So, what's her main thing? Pride and prejudice. <laughs> That'll do for now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a tribute to the Brontes. Oh, yes. Tell me about the Brontes. Uh, Charlotte. Charlotte Bronte, 1816 to 1855. And what is her major contribution? Um, Charlotte's Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre. Yeah. The Brontes and who else? Uh, Anne. There was Anne, yes. 1820 to 1849. And? What did she write? A lot of her stuff has been uh, serialized on, on British television. Is, is it Anne who wrote Wuthering Heights? I don't you know. No, no, that yeah. was Emily. Oh, all right. <laughs> Emily, 1818 to 1848. 1847, Wuthering Heights, Anne Bronte, a number of very, actually very good novels, um, but they're much less known, although yeah. they've, they've all been, been made into superb by uh, TV adaptations. The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, Anne Bronte. Good. Kind of the least celebrated of the three. Yes, she is, unfortunately, because I think she's as good. All right. Um, the Brontes and? And a sketch of Hayworth Parsonage under snow. Yeah, Haworth, Haworth is where they lived. And, and their father was that, that grim-minded old parson. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on we go. Some witticisms, if possible, about Miss Mitford. Well, what do we know about Miss Mitford? Who? I don't know. <laughs> are the Mitfords a, a, a quite prolific group? Na it's Nancy Mitford, isn't it? Nancy Mitford. Nancy Mitford. Social satire, guessing. Oh, you bet, in a big way. Nancy Mitford, 1904 to 1973, 1945, The Pursuit of Love, uh. 1949, Love in a Cold Climate. Now those together have been made into a superb 
TV movie. Nancy Mitford, the Mitfords. They were, they were wealthy young ladies whose father had a title, a baronet. And that meant that all of his daughters were the honorable, the honorable Nancy Mitford. And they used to get together as young girls and laugh about that and call themselves the Hans. <laughs> we are the Hans. That's good. Yeah. So they would have been contemporary with Virginia Woolf? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Yes, they did. Okay, and on? A respectful allusion to George Eliot. Now you ought to know that. Who is George Eliot? A man. No, a woman. <laughs> is that the one who was a woman? Yeah, what? she wrote Middlemarch. Uh, she did. Mary Ann Evans, a.k.a. George Eliot, 1819 to 1880. The Mill on the Floss, Silas Marner, Middlemarch, and dozens of others. A woman who wrote under the name of a man. You had to get published. Good. On. A reference to Mrs. Gaskell. And who is Mrs. Gaskell? That one I don't know. Well, again, he's a novelist, uh, right? Somebody who, who needs to have more attention paid to her. 1810 to 1865, she wrote um, uh, a novel called Cranford. That's another good series. Another good, good, yeah, it is. And then 1854 to 45, North and South. Right. A marvelous one for the, 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 the contrast between people who lived in the South of England and those who lived up in the industrial North. And in 1865, Wives and Daughters. All these are fine, fine books. And she takes them for granted. Those ladies knew who they were. We don't seem to have remembered. Okay. So, reference to those, and one would have done. And that's what you expect me to do, I know. But that's not bloody really well what I'm going to do. So, on. But at second sight, the words seemed not so simple. Yes, indeed. The title, Women in Fiction, might mean, and you may have meant it to mean, women and what they are like. Mm -hmm. Or... That could be fiction. Yes, that could indeed be fiction. <laughs> or it might mean women and the fiction that they write. That they write, yes. Such as me, for instance. Yeah. Or it might mean women and the fiction that is written about them. By men, no doubt. And lots of the, there's lots of that. <laughs> or it might mean that somehow all three are inextricably mixed together and you want me to consider them in that light. Mm -hmm. But when I began to consider the subject in this last way, which seemed the most interesting, I soon saw that it had one fatal drawback. Wow. I should never be able to come to a conclusion. Mm. I should never be able to fulfill what is, I understand, the first duty of a lecturer to hand you after an hour's discourse a nugget of pure truth to wrap up between the pages of your notebooks and keep on the mantelpiece forever. Get the, 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 the irony rather heavily laid on there, eh? It's wonderful. That's, I know that's what you people want to do. You want to have it all down there. Tell you what, that's it. Now I know all about that. Yeah, and I can put it on the shelf and never think about it again. <laughs> which, which they did, which students, to this day, students are doing. <laughs> Good. All I could do was to offer you an opinion upon one minor point. Oh, and the uh, irony again, one minor point. It happens to be vitally important, but it's a minor point. 
<laughs> don't, don't get your knickers in a twist. A woman must have money and ah! her own if she is to write fiction. Well, now that is a revolutionary statement. Yeah. A woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. And that is, and she comes back to that again and again and again throughout her writings. So, of course, the next thing is, where the hell is a woman going to get money? <laughs> Women don't work. <clears throat> Women are not meant to work. They're not engineered for it. And that, as you will see, leaves the great problem of the true nature of woman and the true nature of fiction unsolved. Now we're getting into deep stuff, eh? Now we're, now we're getting down to stuff that uh, many people, men, would perhaps rather not have to dig into. <laughs> <clears throat> now she's getting to be a goddamn nuisance. That's right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have shirked the duty of coming to a conclusion upon these two questions. Women and fiction remain, so far as I'm concerned, unsolved problems. There you go. But in order to make some amends, I am going to do what I can to show you how I arrived at this opinion about the room and the money. Yeah. I am going to develop in your presence as fully and freely as I can the train of thought which led me to think this. Perhaps if I lay bare the ideas, the prejudices that lie behind this statement, you will find that they have some bearing upon women and some upon fiction. <laughs> a little bit here, a little bit there. At any rate, when a subject is highly controversial and any question about sex is that... God knows. Yes. <laughs> One cannot hope to tell the truth. <laughs> Say that again. At any rate, when a subject is highly controversial and any question about sex is that, one cannot hope to tell the truth. Now that's rather challenging, eh? <laughs> You'd be talking about sex or anything controversial. There's no way you can tell the truth. That's the quickest way to trouble. Ha, ha, ha.